welcome to another episode of Jim's Love and Garden. Mm. Okay, so a quick haul video. Um, I went to Ashford Nurseries in Stourbridge yesterday and I bought my uh, cucumber plants for this year. Now I bought six plants um, and I can expect to get between 10 and 15 cucumbers from each of these plants. Um, the reason I buy them, obviously I plant all the other gourds but I always, um, I always buy the cucumber plants. The reason being is cucumbers are notoriously prone to um, damping off at the bottom and that's when basically what you get is the, the the bottom part of the stalk there rots off and then the plant dies um, and really the only successful way of germinating and rearing uh, cucumber plants at this stage is it is in either a heated greenhouse or inside the house now um, I always find it easier to um, to actually buy the plants. Now these are only £1.75 so when you think that this plant's going to yield 10-15 cucumbers um, you know and the price of the cucumber in, in, in the shop's probably about a pound this plant's going to more than pay for itself so you know really when you're trying to justify the cost of the plant it's it's quite easy with the cucumber plant. Um, now these plants all will um, stop in these pots now for probably about another um, four to five weeks and then I'll plant these out into the uh, the border in the greenhouse. Now if you've not grown cucumber plants before even when they get to adult um, plants the, they are still notoriously bad for damping off at the bottom. So the one tip I can give you is if you've not grown cucumbers before the easiest way or the, or the most foolproof way of growing them is to plant them in a pot something about this big. This is a 12 inch pot. Um, fill it up with compost, really good compost. Like with any gourd, they always want to grow quickly, strong, um, and so the you know what you need is a really rich um, compost, good quality compost. Fill it up to the top, plant it at the same level as it was in this pot here. Don't be tempted to plant it any deeper. Um, and then, rather than watering it from the top, put put the pot into a tray and then water the tray at the bottom. Then the water will. Um, through capillary action, the water will soak up through the compost and feed um, feed the plant for you. Now, the first when you first pot it up, you're going to have to water it from the top. So don't put too much water in. All you need to do is wet the uh, the compost. Um, you know, so don't soak it. Let it let it drain out and dry slightly. Then put it in a tray and then begin to start watering from the bottom. You want to sit it in probably about half an inch to an inch of water at the bottom. That's more than enough to let the water. Uh, be in contact with the compost at the bottom and that will, that, uh, as I say, through capillary action that will soak up and then the plant will then send out roots from the bottom down to the water at the bottom and then it will pull itself up. But I've had a number of cucumber plants, even when they get to sort of 8 foot high, 10 foot high, um, I've had um, plants damp off at the bottom through over watering. So it is easily done. The other thing you can do, if you do want to plant it in the border in your greenhouse like I do, what you can do is plant that into a pot, um, possibly something a bit smaller than this, um, and then sink that pot into the ground and then never water in the pot, only water around it. That's the other way you can do it. But um, the key with cucumbers is uh, not to overwater them and always try to keep the, uh, the root stock there dry. You can put a collar over them. Um, just to try and protect them a little bit, you know, like a you know, cut a section out of a pot bottle and put it around so water doesn't actually get to the uh, the shoot. But you need to be careful because by doing that, um, you can um, sort of make water stay around there, which is going to make the uh, the problem worse. Right. The other tip with cucumbers: um, cucumbers naturally are both male and female. You have me uh, male flowers and female flowers. If you get um, if you get a, um, a variety which has um, got both male and female um, flowers on it, you're going to have to pull off all of the male flowers. Um, and the, 
And the way to tell them apart is the male flower will have a narrow stalk r uh, uh, running up to the flower. Uh, the female will have a more of a bulbous, shorter um, um, stalk running up to the flower, and that's what's going to form into the cucumber. This is a real pain because if you if you miss any one of the male flowers, the the cucumber will get uh, pollinated, and then the cucumber becomes bitter and is not very nice to eat. So. The best bit of advice I can give you is buy female only cucumber plants. As you can see, this one's called Female F1. If you buy a female cucumber plant, there are only female flowers on it. So you don't need to worry about pulling all the male flowers off. So that's the best way, the best bit of advice I can give you. So when you're selecting your um, cucumber plant, always get, either if you buy plants or seed, always get a, a female only variety then um, you won't have any um, possibility of the cucumbers being pollinated and then turning bitter. Those are the best tips I can give you for growing cucumbers. Okay, and the last plant that I got from Ashwood is this pepper cayenne. Um, I've not grown cayenne before, but uh, I thought I'd give it a go, and this was a nice looking plant for 175. I don't think that was too bad, so I'll be growing that alongside the jalapenos and the sweet peppers um, this year in the greenhouse. Okay, so it's time to um, pot up the, um, the jalapeno chilies. Now, these are <coughs> As you can see, they're doing pretty well. They're about an inch or so high. Um, so what I'm going to do now, I've the, the, the sort of the big enough to sort of catch hold of. What I'm going to do is put my finger underneath the ground like that, and without actually touching the stalk, and if you can see that, where I've got the plant in there. And I'm going to plant these up into these um, square pots, so I can put most other things in. Try not to touch the plant itself. Now these. Um, these plants are about to start to grow reasonably quick. We haven't really got the heat at the moment um, for them to grow because things like um, chilies and peppers and that do like the do like the heat. So what I'm going to do is put these in these in these pots and put them in the windowsill um, in the greenhouse, and that's going to be one of the hottest spots. Obviously, always remember hot air rises, so uh, you know the higher you can get them up um, in the greenhouse, the you know the warmer it's going to be for them so you know these are plants that do need a bit of warmth so I'm just planting them in exactly the same as they were in here and I'm you, you can't really see what I'm doing but all I'm doing is sticking my finger underneath like that without touching the plant so I'm just basically touching the roots and then pull out the you can see there the tapping root at the bottom so there's the plant and then stick it stick your finger in make sure that the tapping root's going straight down all as best you can and then water these straight away um, and then what it'll do is it'll wash the wash the compost in round the roots uh, to get them a good start. Now, with with um, with peppers, you want to keep them as well watered as you possibly can do. Uh, but what you don't want to do is have them sitting in sort of water. You don't want them to be um, sort of overly damp. And we've had a few questions in the past about you know how's the best way to get hot chilies. Um, now mine were quite quite nice last year. Um, and all I do is I water them probably twice a week um, and I have a tray underneath them so they've got a bit of water underneath them but um, you know don't don't over water chilies you know you want them to um, you know you want them to have water but don't sort of you know they're not like um, tomatoes and stuff where they're you know they're fast growing uh, you know you want them to grow at a reasonable rate so I'm just going to carry on potting these up um, as you know the the mouse at the top of the uh, um, of the pepper plants. Um, they are recovering, believe it or not, I'll just quickly show you them now. Um, so they are recovering but um, they've got a way to go yet. They, they should be like this now to be honest. Um, now these plants are going to, these chilli plants are going to end up in pots probably about six inches across um, and I'm going to grow these in the windowsill in the greenhouse. So this is probably, um, I'll, I'll pot these on probably as soon as they get to kind of here into bigger pots. Uh, but for now they'll they'll stay in here, um, and then the the sweet peppers will go in the borders with the, uh, the tomato plants. So I'll just show you the pepper plant. Um, I don't know if you can see there are actually weeds there. So that's what the that's what the pepper look, pepper plants look like. Now this one here, even though it's been eaten off by a um, a mouse, um, and this one here, they are actually sending up more leaves. So hopefully. 
they will recover. I think this one here that's been sort of eaten off altogether, I don't think they're going to do anything. But I've got basically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight plants that I think will survive out of the out of the mouse going them. So fingers crossed, I'll be able to pop these up like this um, in a in a couple of three weeks' time as soon as they develop some leaves. So obviously with the leaf being sort of nibbled off that side, kind of held them back a bit. But it looks like I'm going to end up with um, Mark, don't laugh. I think I'm going to end up with probably about two dozen um, jalapeno plants here. So, but uh, that should be more than enough um, jalapenos to keep me going for the winter. Okay, so the broccoli's just about ready to go in. As you can see, the plants are um, about kind of seven or eight inches high now. Um, I'm more concerned about the uh, the roots getting um, sort of pot bound. So I watered them last night, so they're reasonably damp, but not too damp, so they'll come out in one go. So um, I'll put them in the ground now. Okay, so from a ground preparation point of view, now this ground has all been dug over, rotivated. Um, it's had muck and straw and... Um, wood chip all rotivated into it so that's all in the ground. There are a few potatoes coming up, this is where the potatoes were last year as you can see uh, the odd one but basically the broccoli is going to go along here um, along this side of the tunnel so basically from there all the way along to there. Now to prepare the ground all brassicas are effectively um, leafy um, plants so it's, it's basically the leaves that you want. Now if you're growing things like um, purple sprouting broccoli or or, uh, or, or sort of um, um, other brassicas where you're not you, you, you're not you're not wanting the leaves like swede for example um, then you wouldn't necessarily do this but I want these plants to go up to a good start so um, I'm going to put I'm going to put two things in the ground um, the first one is this um, now this is coffee grounds now this comes from Starbucks the uh, the coffee company um, and these are the those are the kind of used um, coffee grounds that come out of the machine now there's a whole there's a whole bin bag of it here now it, it has gone slightly green which is just basically the mold um, I got this probably about um, two months or so ago um, there's basically a, um, a bin load there so all I need to do really is get a um, get a spade and just sort of break that up now what this will do this is going to be rich in um, nitrogen it also deters slugs so it's, it's good for a number of things really so what I'm going to do is put this on the surface of the ground um, <clears throat> what I've done obviously is I've dug all the ground over and then what I've done is I've walked all over it so basically just walk up and down on the ground rake it level and then walk on it again rake it level and then just, just keep doing that a few times until you get the ground nice and compacted and level like this um, all brassicas like firm ground so um, you know you don't want it absolutely rock hard you do need to dig it but they do like the ground to be reasonably firm so for, you know for any brassicas from your sprouts, um, flower sprouts, broccoli, cabbage, kale, um, even you know even things like swedes and stuff like that you need to get the ground firm because that's basically the way they like it so this nitrogen is going to go on the surface predominantly it's going to go on this side here where the kale is going to be because obviously for the kale I want the leaves for the um, for the broccoli I want the actual flowers which is you know so I don't want to put too much nitrogen on this side um, so I'll put the, most of this over on this side in addition to that, I'm going to put some of this, which is bloodfish and bone meal. Now, this is a, an organic, slow-release um, <clears throat> fertiliser. And as you can see, it's reasonably balanced. Um, you know, the NPK, so the nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium are um, reasonably um, well balanced. So what I'll be doing is just pouring a bit of that um, over on the ground as well and then raking it all level so it's all sort of in, you know, in the surface of the ground. And then that will release, as I say, you know, the bloodfish and bone meal is a slow release fertiliser, so that will release over the space of about four months or so. So that that will that will still be going after these plants have come out, basically. I would recommend that um, you don't handle this with your bare hands. Um, bone meal is effectively classed as carcinogenic, so um, you know, as soon as it's on the ground, it's okay. But or I wouldn't recommend you put your hand in there and sprinkle it out. Just get yourself a trowel, you know, like that one there put it in and then just sprinkle it from there. I'll, I'll show you in a minute on a video and then that'll be the ground prep. So I'll put the, um, I'll put the coffee on and the, uh, the bloodfish and bone and then I'll be ready to put the plants in. Okay then, so for the coffee all I'm going to do is literally just lightly sprinkle um, over the top like that. You don't need to have too much, too much in there. 
Um, it's a really nice smell of coffee actually when you're doing this. But this is really good for a number of reasons. This is going to put nitrogen into the ground, which is going to help the leaf growth of the plant. But also, it um, slugs really don't like this. So you want to keep this reasonably on the surface of the ground like that. Just rake it in lightly, and then um, you know if any slugs come on here, it will most certainly deter them. So I'm not going to put too much of this on. If it was kale or um, kale or cabbage or something like that, where I'm actually going to eat the leaves. Um, I'd probably put more on, but uh, because this is um, broccoli, I'm just going to put a bit on. Okay, and for the hoof horn and blood, all I'm doing is going to trowel, put that in the bag like that, and get yourself um, a bit out. And then all you need to do basically is just lightly dust the top of the soil with it like that. Um, that's that's more than enough. And then as soon as you've done that, all you need to do is get your rake, and then basically rake that into the top of the soil like that and then as the as the rain comes um, what it'll do is that will wash that into the ground to the roots of the plants but it'll be near the surface which is where you need it for your young plants because that's obviously where their roots are okay so as you can see um, across the bottom of the screen here you can see the green line um, that's just a line I've struck now what I'm going to do is put three um, three of these plants in um, so three and then three I'm going to put them reasonably close together uh, you know, I don't need to space them too far apart. Um, so that one's going there. Obviously, the ground's reasonably hard. And then I'm going to put one about, one about there, like that. And then basically one in the middle. So they end up being around a foot apart. That's all you need. Um, obviously, if you're going to grow these plants on for a bit longer, um, then uh, you know you could potentially put them a bit further apart. But you can tell from the roots. Uh, that they're more than ready to go out. So I'm going to plant them just slightly deeper than they were in the pot, like that. Um, I don't know if you saw that, but I'm basically, um, if that's the plant there, I'm basically burying them up to the seed leaves there. And the reason for that is all brassicas um, don't have brilliant root um, systems to be honest with you. So if you can plant them a little bit deeper, you get three benefits. One the roots stay wetter so they grow better. Also because the further down in the ground they get a better anchor and so that the less um, the less prone to falling over or the roots getting damaged. Um, and then thirdly um, there's there's less chance of any sort of nasties getting at the getting at the bottom of the stem there. So you know any bugs anything like that. So I always find if you plant them like this is the best way to do it. So I'm putting starting a new row here. Um, again, planting them up to the uh, the, uh, the 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 seed leaves. So I'm burying about sort of three inches of the stem. And then all I'm going to do is just plant these a foot apart, three rows, and work my way back. Um, and then they'll they'll grow quite nicely here. Obviously, water them in, give them a good water to start with. Um, and then after that, they just need watering when it gets dry. Okay, so that's them all in. So basically they're a foot apart, so the, the, uh, the rows are a foot between and the plants are about a foot between. So basically it's a, um, it's like a grid of them. So the, they'll basically, uh, the reason for planting them this close is I'm not expecting these to get too big or old. I'm expecting them to get about 18 inches high and then they'll form the florets on the top. So um, with, with these I'm expecting them to have... Um, basically cropped in about 12 weeks so they're already four weeks old so within the next two months I'm expecting these to have formed the florets and we've harvested them and they're out the way then so I'm not expecting these plants to get too big so all I need to do now is to um, to water them um, you know to give them a good watering and um, basically just 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 make sure they're free of any um, sort of pests and that so the things you need to look out for with brassicas as I've, as I've explained before pigeons will obviously eat them um, things like um, aphids will have a go at them so if you've um, had anything like rabbits and rodents and things like that will obviously have a go as well so if you've got a frame like this one um, that's ideal because that'll prevent um, pigeons and things like that coming on them and uh, you need you need to watch out for small dogs as well Dorothy come on sweetheart um, so the, you know, so they're as protected as they possibly can be in here. The only other thing that you may need to worry about when they're young like this is slugs. Um, I have known slugs to have a go at them in the past. Um, but uh, all being well, they'll um, stop. And obviously the classic one is um, um, the, um, 
cabbage butterfly, you know, the white, the white one that comes in, cabbage white, and they'll come in and lay eggs underneath and then the, the caterpillars eat the plants. So if you've got a cage like this, obviously they can't get through sort of this type of net. So the butterflies can't get them. So as long as we keep the door shut, um, you know, no pigeons or butterflies can get at them, which are the main two. Um, as I say, you need to look out for slugs and also um, rodents as well. But uh, apart from that, these should be okay. Okay, so I'm going to go through um, a few of the comments and questions that have come over from the channel um, in in um, April. So I've not done this for quite a few weeks now, I think it's about four or five weeks since I've done it. But uh, the first comment comes from Fifty Shades of Green and also Richard um, Tuxford. And I think um, it, it, it's the same kind of question. Basically, you need to understand that um, all, all brassicas are biannual. So basically, they'll grow one year and then the second year they'll they'll basically go to flower, basically they'll bolt and they'll go to flower and then um, do their thing. Now, that's generally, basically, that's the way that they grow. Obviously, if you look at um, things like broccoli, um, that's that's more of an annual. So basically, it'll, it'll, it'll form the plant and then form the florets within the first year. Um, but, but most brassicas will go through the winter, basically. But the, the way that the plant works is it's looking at the how much sunlight there is compared to how much dark there is and it'll denote um, if it's getting close to the end of the year or, or, or the start of the next year with the, with the amount of daylight either increasing or decreasing and unfortunately the problem that you've got is if, the, if they see that the, um, that the sunlight is um, decreasing then increasing they will, the, the plant then knows it's in its second year so if you've planted late on in the year um, It'll, it'll realise that it's getting closer to the end of the year and then the following year if it starts to see the daylight increasing what it'll do is it'll naturally go to seed because uh, that's effectively uh, the second year in its cycle if you like. Irrespective of how much the plant's developed um, it will think it's its second year and there's not a lot you can do um, if they start to bolt really you know the plant's already started to shut down so um, if you have got um, brassicas which are um, you know, sending out flowers and stuff like that. Really, there's nothing more you can do other than um, take off the plant what you can, um, and, and obviously eat that with, with with most brassicas you can eat. Um, you know, the leaves on you know sort of pretty much any brassicas. Um, but um, you know, if the plant has run to seed, it thinks it's its second year, and there's nothing you can do to stop it from bolting. It'll just it'll just carry on doing that. So all I can advise you to do is set some more seed and basically start again with them. Um, the uh, the next one comes from uh, Mr. Davis. Um, I apologise if I'm pronouncing your um, first name wrong. I think it's um, Ifan Ifan Davis. I think. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing it right. And um, talking about runner beans, is it better to buy them in the shop or to or to save your own seed? Um, I've been I've been saving my um, own seed all my life. I've never actually bought any um, runner beans, as I've said in previous um, episodes. My runner beans actually originate from my great grandmother, um, and and basically um, they've they've um, you know I've just kept them year after year after year after year, and um, I just put in what I saved from last year. The one thing you need to be careful of is if you're growing multiple types of beans, they will cross pollinate. So um, if you're growing, like for example this year I'm growing climbing beans and also runner beans, I will keep them as separated as I possibly can do because you will get cross-pollinating um, occurring if, if an insect goes from one to the other. Um, and there's not really much you can do to get around that. So if you want a pure variety, uh, then I would say uh, from a pros and cons point of view, buy it from a shop because then you know it is most certainly that variety. Um, but if you just want runner beans or whatever, then you know saving your own seed is by far the cheapest way to do it. I mean, uh, you know you can you know you can save hundreds, if not thousands, of seeds every year. Um, you know for the following year, so it, you know so it's really easily done. And to be honest with you, you know why go out and buy them if you can save them yourself? Uh, because runner bean seeds aren't, aren't the most cheapest things to buy. But the only um, sort of pro to buying them really is if you want a particular specific variety and you only grow a few of each type of plant and you grow them close together then obviously you've got no choice you need to buy the seed to get the same variety again because they will cross pollinate and then you get a, you know then you then you cross the variety. Um, the next question comes from um, Pete's Kitchen Garden and he's talking about winter vegetables uh, when's the last time to um, to sow and I think he's specifically talking about brassicas 
Um, yeah, I mean, if you're putting them in the ground where your onions are coming from, obviously you'll harvest your onions in July. Um, so put your brassicas in four weeks before then, so at the beginning of, I don't know, June or whatever. And then, you know, your brassicas will be sort of, I don't know, this size or possibly slightly even bigger. Um, and then you'll be able to put them out into the ground after that. But, but as I've, you know, as I've said in the first comment, um, you know, do understand that brassicas are sort of biennial, or, or some of them are really annual. Like things like um, broccoli is is, is annual. Um, so, what you want to do is give yourself the, uh, the the most amount of growing time in the season as you can. So, if you can start them slightly earlier in bigger pots and let the plants get a little bit more established before you put them into the ground, then you're going to get a better harvest. So that's that's the best advice I can give you. But yeah, sow them as early as you possibly can do. To, to align with whenever your ground's going to become available. Um, the, the next one comes from Allotment Life, and um, they were talking about uh, the soil that I've got at the back here and also down the bottom. This, uh, the ground's quite heavy and clay, um, and so um, I've been putting loads of organic material in there, grass cuttings, um, wood chip and all that kind of stuff. And uh, the comment from uh, Allotment Life was basically to put in um, river washed soil because that will break up the um, the clay. The other thing you can do with clay as well is um, liming the soil will also uh, break up the clay as well but obviously if you put lime on the ground you need to be careful what you plant in there. Um, things like brassicas and that will be happy with the lime soil. Um, you need to be careful putting things like potatoes in there um, because they you know you'll get scab on the potatoes if you put lime in the ground the, the year that you plant them. Uh, next one comes from Muddy Boots and uh, um, Nigel was asking me about how I prepare the um, the greenhouse borders. Basically, what I do <coughs> for the greenhouse borders, I've got these wooden boxes which are about best part of two foot deep, um, sort of eighteen inches, two foot deep, and that that's full of soil. And obviously, I plant the the, um, the cucumbers and the tomatoes straight into there. What I do every year is effectively empty that out uh, completely, and then I put in um, at the bottom. I put in a layer of, um, of of grass, which is probably when I put it in, it's probably, probably about nine inches deep. Obviously, that will compress it to put the soil on it uh, to probably something down about I don't know two or three inches, I guess. Um, so I'll put a layer of um, grass cuttings in, which is about nine inches. Then on top of that, I'll put chicken manure, probably about six inches, and then I put back in um, some of the soil that I took out, um, and then sort of mix all that in, and then I basically build the border up right to the top. And then over the space of um, I don't know three or four weeks, that the, the the soil level will actually drop by about six inches as all of that decays underneath. The reason I do this is the, the grass um, decays as it decays; it gives off heat, and that will warm up the bed, which will promote um, rapid growth in the tomatoes and the cucumbers, and that it warms the greenhouse up basically. Um, and the, obviously the chicken muck has got all goodness in there, um, you, you know, for the plants. And that's basically, it's like a Victorian trick of um, building up the borders in your greenhouse. Um, uh, I had a comment from um, Mark Davidson saying that uh, he was laughing at how many tomatoes and, and uh, brassicas I've got. Yeah, I, the seed was old, so I put in loads and, uh, and pretty much everyone germinated. So I've got loads and loads of t um, tomatoes. The tomatoes now kind of looking, you know, sort of like this. Um, these are the money makers and I've got the Alicantes over here. Um, so I've saved quite a lot of tomatoes this year because I'm going to grow a bumper crop of tomatoes. Um, and tomatoes really are a cash crop to be honest with you. So um, I'm going to be putting tomatoes in this greenhouse and also the second greenhouse. Um, in the second greenhouse I'm going to be growing them in pots. In this one I'm going to be growing them as, as I do normally. Um, so I've given loads and loads of tomatoes away to people. Um, and um, you know, so I've, you know, none of the plants have gone to waste. And also the kale plants, um, I had hundreds of those. So um, I think I, I think Mark's comment was, "You got enough for cube got to fill cube gardens," and he's right. Um, so, but don't worry, the plants haven't gone to waste. I've, I've kind of give them out to loads of different people. So um, you know, so they haven't gone to waste kind of thing. A lot of life also said about. Um, the comments about grow bags and stuff like that. The comment that I made is grow bags are like um, sort of bags of compost, and when you put them on the ground, they're only about sort of five inches tall. So the um, you know there's not enough room for the roots to, to to go in from tomatoes and stuff like that and, and cucumbers. So what you need to do um, is the the stuff that's in the compost bag um, is 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 good compost, and you can put that into pots or turn the bag on its side. So rather than having it flat. If you turn it upright, so and they cut it in half, so you end up with two halves of a grow bag. 
you can then put tomatoes in there, then you've got the depth. Really with tomato plants you need to have, I'd, I'd say at least sort of a foot if not 18 inches of, of depth for the, you know, for the roots to form properly. Uh, if you put it on its side obviously you've only probably got about four or five inches. Um, but I, I misunderstood the comment from Allotment Life and basically what they were saying was they grow their tomatoes in, in pots and then they put the pots on top of grow bags. So when the roots of the tomato plants come out of the bottom of the pots they then go into the grow bag compost and they um, get the goodness from there as well. So that's, that, that's basically the comment. So I, I understand what you're saying now. But yeah, that's a good idea. Um, next comment comes from Fifty Shades of Green. Um, talking about uh, rhubarb, when do you move it and, uh, and how? <coughs> I've never moved my um, rhubarb, as you can see my rhubarb grows really well and moving rhubarb isn't easy. Rhubarb has a um, like a tapping root which goes down for you know three, four, five feet into, into the ground and that's how it gets the moisture out of the ground. If you move rhubarb about uh, it most certainly weakens the plant and that obviously you can't move that tapping root so you have to cut that off. Um, so, in answer to your question, I've never moved my rhubarb. I, I leave it exactly where it is. It's been there for probably about, well, at least 15 years to my knowledge it's been there. And, and the longer you leave it in a given place, the better it'll grow. I don't split the, um, the crowns or anything like that. I just leave it as it is. All I do is I just put more and more work on top and let the worms take that underneath and, um, and, it, and it grows really well. Um, if you do need to move rhubarb, and I suggest you do this the least amount as possible. Uh, but if you do want to move rhubarb, most certainly move it when it's dormant. So what you need to do is wait till the either the end of the year or right at the beginning of the year. Um, so before it starts. So you know you're talking sort of January, February, March time. Uh, most certainly, you know, if if not before then, or the back end of the year, so November, December time. That's the kind of time frame you can move it. If there's anything growing out of it, I suggest you don't move it. Um, when you do move it, you can split it. You know, you can split the crowns just by putting a spade through it and chopping it. Um, but you will most certainly weaken the plant, and it's going to take it two or three years to regain the strength back after you've moved it. So, don't don't keep moving it about. Decide on a place where you're going to leave it, plant it there, and then don't move it again. That's the best advice I can give you. Um, and rhubarb will naturally um, sort of grow out anyway, so it'll it'll kind of spread. It, it does it naturally. So I don't think you need to sort of chop it and split it and stuff like that, and, and unless you really need to, um, you, you know, to move it or you want to multiply it anyway. But uh, my best advice for rhubarb is feed it. Uh, apart from that, leave it well alone, and then just 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 leave it to grow because that's the way it likes to be. Um, next comment comes from um, actually Jason Smith and also. Um, Jason and Tina, it's a lot of upcycling and recycling. Um, talking about the bees that we've got in the bin there, and they don't believe that they're honeybees. I'm no expert on bees, uh, but um, so um, Jason Smith and also Jason and Tina from a lot of upcycling believe there are either small bumblebees, uh, there are the hairy footed flower bees, um, or the um, Colette's bees, or they're actually rock bees. So, uh, but I, I've, I've got no idea, but anyway, they're, they're more than um, okay in the bin, I'm not going to move them about, and when the weather gets a bit warmer, I'm going to take the lid off and hopefully they'll, they'll move on then. Uh, and the last comment comes from John Payne, and he says, uh, uh, how often do you divide your rhubarb? I, I, you know, as I've just said, I basically don't, um, don't um, divide it. Um, I'll just leave it as it is, but as I say, if you are going to divide it, divide it in the winter months when you're, uh, you know, when the plant's dormant. And the very last comment, sorry, uh, uh, sort of one last one, um, is um, about clover compost. Now, clover compost is the make, so as you can see, that's the, you can show you the bag. So that's what the, that's what the clover compost bag looks like. Um, and I get this from, um, you don't tend to see this very often in garden centres, this typically comes from like a lot of exercises and places like that. It is, in my estimation, the best compost you can get on the market um, and it is, it is really good um, compost. It's made from um, uh, like a peat type um, product uh, which is sustainable, So, uh, but, but this is by far, for vegetables, this is by far the best compost and I've used probably every compost which is on the market. And above all, 
I prefer that because it, it holds the moisture. It's got good. It's got goodness in there, which will last at least four months. So you know, it'll, it, it's great for vegetables. If you are going to grow um, potted plants, um, the the nutrients in that are going to last somewhere in the region of four months. So. If you are going to plant um, anything there long term, you will need to think about feeding it after the you know the initial four months. Um, but from a but from a moisture content and a, and a and a quality of compost, it's the best on the market. I've I've bought another few bags of this yesterday, and from my um, allotment society, it's, I think it's four pound fifty a bag, and it, it's money well spent to be honest with you. So I hope this episode does us some use to you. Please don't hesitate to put any comments you've got below and I'll always get back to you and I'll see you on the next episode of Jim's on the Garden.